Innovation is defined by Webster's Dictionary as a new idea, method, or device, novelty, or the introduction of something new. And when innovation meets a game like Pokemon, it's quite a magical experience, especially when it comes to how innovation in the series affects how we go about speedrunning. While the initial goal to beat the game as fast as possible will always be there, getting to that end point can look completely different all because of innovation. For example, Pokemon Let's Go adds gym requirements to catch certain Pokemon in order to enter a gym. Sun and Moon introduces trials and totem Pokemon to replace gyms entirely, or even something as simple as the way we travel on an all-terrain vehicle legendary Pokemon in Scarlet and Violet. But the game that does this by far the best is Pokemon Legends Arceus. Legends Arceus is such a wonderful atmospheric experience through its story and gameplay that builds upon itself by forcing you to keep catching Pokemon and befriend an entire village through a ton of side quests. And before you know it, you're completely absorbed into this cycle of catching enough Pokemon to reach new lands and confronting the god of Pokemon themselves. While this is an absolutely amazing experience casually, when it comes to speedrunning Pokemon Legends Arceus, sad to say that the game was originally my most hated Pokemon speedrun of all time. In fact, I was so petty about my hatred for this particular speedrun that I literally had it plastered onto my layout. I'm submitting this as uh, I hate this game. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm done with this speedrun for good. Kind of embarrassing looking back on this, but I can't really blame myself. It's a lot like when I transitioned from learning competitive Pokemon single battles to the official competitive Pokemon format known as VGC. In concept, the difference between the two is literally just one extra Pokemon on the field for both opponents. How much more complicated could it get? Well, a lot, actually. And the reality of that hits you hardest when you attempt getting past that initial barrier to entry. You can't exactly jump in without preparation and become a prodigy. You have to have a game plan, form lines of strategy, and make sure you can back yourself out of a corner. And this exact argument also applies to speedrunning Legends Arceus. Most of which is thanks to how every little thing you do when catching a Pokemon becomes amplified to a ridiculous degree of detail thanks to the research point system. Instead of enjoying the sights and rolling along with the seals on the beach, we now have to pay close attention to things like if a Pokemon was a boy or a girl, is it light or heavy, will it evolve into a beautifly or moth? You see how things like this could be really hard to keep track of? And since the game had just come out at the time of me speedrunning, the route for what was potentially the fastest strategy was still being figured out, which meant we could see so many changes within a day that I couldn't keep up without overwhelming myself. And so I decided to do a single run, post on the leaderboards, and never speedrun this Pokemon game again for the first time in my speedrunning career. That is, until a couple years later when the biggest speedrun charity marathon, Games Done Quick, accepted Legends Arceus for the thousands of viewers at home. While I was extremely happy for my friends getting accepted into GDQ, I still questioned how a game with such a complicated and volatile route that relied on a ton of spawns and catch luck could possibly be speed ran in a marathon setting without running into a ton of unreasonable issues. So out of pure curiosity and wanting to support my friends on stage, I left my hate for the speed run behind to tune in myself. And to my surprise, I couldn't take my eyes off of what I was watching. So what exactly changed for me at that moment? Well, it was the beauty of how things just kind of worked out so fluidly throughout most of the run. Unlike before, there was hardly any scrambling for last minute catches in the old route, and instead, it all just felt so concise and consistent. A lot of it definitely came down to the world record holder Halkyrie's knowledge of the game, but just from the surface alone, you could easily tell how many years speedrunners put into figuring out this run. And it all started with a single species of Pokemon that would act as the catalyst for launching this run into my top three favorite speedruns to watch of all time. But to truly explain my love for the art that is Pokemon Legends Arceus speedruns, we have to start at the very beginning of the game where an important step is taken in all Pokemon adventures.
For us speedrunners, Cyndaquil will be the obvious choice thanks to how efficient it is at earning research points. Research points in Pokemon Legends Arceus are earned from random things that you do while catching, battling, and interacting with Pokemon. But the big reason that these points are so important is because in order to unlock future levels in the game, we'll have to earn a ridiculous amount of points which brings us back to the starter Pokemon of choice. Because unlike the other two starters, Rowlet and Oshawott, Cyndaquil actually starts with a move that can immediately earn you those research points as soon as you grab it. But unlike most Pokemon games where the best strategy is to use your starter Pokemon from the beginning to the end of the game, starter Pokemon will only be useful throughout the very first level in Legends Arceus. This is mainly due to how beneficial it is to use a bunch of different Pokemon with a bunch of different moves throughout the entire game. And so, with that small piece of information in mind, it becomes even more clear why Cyndaquil is chosen as the main starter Pokemon thanks to all the research that it can earn from its learn set that connects with a much bigger list of wild Pokemon in the Obsidian Fieldlands than the other two starters. To get a clear picture of what earning these points looks like, let's start off with the first trip in the Fieldlands where we'll be forced to first KO Volo's Togepi with a bunch of quick attacks, get past a tutorial by catching a Bidoof, Starly, and Shinx to prove our worth to the villagers, and then, and only then, will we finally have the freedom to raid over more of the map. Our current goal at this point in the game is to earn a total of 500 research points to reach star rank 1 in order to be granted access to the rest of the obsidian field lands across this bridge. But as it stands, we only have this much space to work with. And so, in order to reach that goal as efficiently as possible, we'll turn our focus to that single species of Pokemon that I mentioned earlier, the Wormpole Evolutionary Line. On the way to finding the Wormpole Line, we can obtain freshly respawned Pokemon from the catching tutorial such as Bidoof and Starly, finish the final bits of the force tutorial, and begin catching Wormpool before teleporting back to the camp for a trip to the other side of the map. Now, I have a question for you all. Do you happen to remember the order we caught or received every single Pokemon since the beginning of the game? If your answer was no, then that's something you would have to keep in mind as a speedrunner pushing forward with a party filled up with six. Because each of those six party members will keep on earning EXP as we catch and battle more and more Pokemon. Because doing things in this order sets us up for multiple benchmarks that we want to hit in the near future. Like catching just enough of the same easy to catch Pokemon along the way and obtaining fast evolutions from our starter and catching tutorial Pokemon filling up our party. One thing to note is that while traveling to this side of the map won't get us Pokemon such as Weasel or Eevee, having already caught a Wormpole gives us a really good reason to tunnel vision on the Beautiflies. However, Beautifly in this area kind of remind me of the good old days when RPGs let you wander into places that you shouldn't be, where you could get absolutely obliterated by high-level monsters at level 1. Because at this point in the game, most Syndic will reach level 9 or lower with all the EXP that we earned, while these winged monstrosities spawn in at level 18 to 22. But since they're found at such high levels compared to us, it means that we'll snag a gargantuan amount of EXP if we can catch or defeat them. So just like a real RPG gamer who wants to avoid grinding low-level monsters, we need to come up with a reliable way to catch them or just straight up cheese these titans in battle. Unlike most older Pokemon games, catching and battling in Arceus is extremely easy to abuse thanks to backstrikes and sunlocks. When throwing a Pokeball at a Pokemon in this game, you typically want to make sure that the Pokemon is either completely caught off guard, unaware of your presence, distracted by something, or not exhibiting aggressive behavior whatsoever. And while an unsuccessful successful catch can cause a Pokemon to be aware and aggressive as it breaks out of the Pokeball, this can be avoided entirely if you time a Pokeball throw moments before it can throw up an aggressive aura that causes Pokeballs to bounce off of it. However, the even wilder thing to me is that there is literally no penalty whatsoever for doing this besides losing Pokeballs to throwing a ball over and over again until it finally gives up and eventually gets in the ball. But where it gets even cheesier is through the battle system with wild Pokemon because of how backstrikes and running outside of the battle radius can affect a wild Pokemon battle. For example, the low-level Cyndaquil and Halkyrie's GDQ run got paralyzed on Beautifly's second turn. 
but he needed a successful third turn in order to finish it off consistently. So, to avoid paralysis during that fight with zero repercussions, he disengaged and re-engaged the battle. This caused Cyndaquil to be no longer paralyzed, while Beautifly was still extremely beat up and stunned since the battle was restarted entirely through backstriking. Backstrikes on their own not only increase your chances of catching a Pokemon for the entire duration of the battle, but they also give you one free turn to use whatever move you want on them. However, the general fastest strategy with Beautifly will be to catch one and KO two, since the battle radius cheese is decently slow compared to just a regular catch. But sometimes it's just outright worth going for, since catching a Beautifly is a really tricky thing to do, given you only have a 40 to 29% chance of success, depending on the level of the Beautifly. In total, this crazy method of brute forcing through Beautiflies earns speedrunners not only enough EXP to evolve multiple party members, but also gets them a ton of points for both Cyndaquil and Beautifly's dex entries by using the move Ember, then KOing the Beautifly with a rock move. There is a a small catch however when it comes to the research point system since you can't receive any points you've earned for a pokemon until you've officially obtained one which is why i'm happy to say there's a really neat backup strategy to this problem since evolving gives you a lot more points than you would think it would but first if you've enjoyed your time with this video so far consider subscribing we're getting pretty close to 100,000 subscribers and every little bit helps along the way as an example wormpool gets the points for evolving out of being a wormpool while also earning points for evolving into Silcoon or Cascoon. This is also the case for the cocoons evolving into and out of their winged forms, earning up to a total of four different research task points just from completing the one three-stage evolution by itself. And it's through ever-evolving strategies such as this that make Legends Arceus such a beautiful speedrun. Your choices are so vast, containing options within options that you can use to build towards a future that has you beating this game in creative and fast ways that you might not have experienced before ever playing through the game normally. Even at this very moment, Halkyrie, the world record holder and the person who has likely played this game more times than anyone else in the world, is still finding more of these ever-evolving strategies. By the way, have I mentioned that this whole crazy beautiful section was only within the first 30 minutes of the game and only gave us 600 research points? Yeah, there's still a lot of speedrun left to cover. Yippee! While 600 is more than enough points to pass the very first star ranking needed to move forward, if we want to have a chance of making it to the second rank and leaving the Obsidian Field Lands, we'll have to literally triple how many points we just earned. And I know that sounds overwhelming with what I've already covered, but thanks to the legendary speedrunner and programmer Corvime, we have a resource in the form of a website that calculates exactly what each piece of research does for our point total. Diving into Cyndaquil's dex entries in particular, you'll notice notice three things. One, using the move Ember earns you double the points compared to most other research tasks on this list. Two, obtaining 100 total points from Cyndaquil's research lands us an extra bonus of 100 points. And three, perfecting every single task doesn't seem to give any bonus points for some reason or another. If you then compare these findings to the other Pokemon in the decks, you'll learn that the three characteristics I just mentioned persist in every single Pokemon research point entry. And now that we know that we can earn more points through doubled point tasks, are able to get a bonus of points from reaching 100 points, and will get more value out of our time by not perfecting every single dex entry, we can begin to see the bigger picture to our end goal of 8,500 points. So now that we have a plan of action, the big question becomes, what Pokemon and tasks should we start to aim for? Well, the short answer to that question comes down to a nice list of 54 Pokemon. But just like the speedrun, it's a lot more complicated than going off of this simple list. So at this very moment, our new goal is to reach star rank 2 with the power of the new understanding we have for the system. And given we now have the ability to cross the bridge, this gives us a massive opportunity to find a ton of new Pokemon to catch 
match, as well as a fresh slew of battles to deal with. When initially crossing the bridge, all we have to our name is a few Pokeballs, berries from trees, and the ability to run, roll, and crouch. Many of those features will be made obsolete the second that we obtain a Mount Pokemon because of the speeds that you'll be able to travel on while using them. So the focus on the much slower tasks that give out massive research point rewards in return become much more appealing in these last few minutes of not having a mount. Things such as feeding, battling wild mons, and hitting shaking trees or rocks are easily some of the slowest research tasks available to us, but become very worth going for given their double point value. Multitasking will be the name of the game each time we commit to a slow task. Generally, we want to keep moving as much as possible no matter what we're doing, but tasks such as feeding make that goal impractical since a Pokemon needs to physically walk up to a piece of food to eat it, and if we walk too far away from that piece of food, it'll straight up despawn. So to make this task as worth it as possible, we'll start camping near a group of two or more Pokemon, throw a food at one, throw it at the next, catch the first eating Pokemon, then catch the final eating Pokemon in order to divide our time as best as possible. Feeding also has the benefit of improving a Pokemon's catch rate, which is just a nice cherry on top. The sections that follow the feeding arc is where we'll finally be able to experience the true euphoria of Legends Arceus speedruns on the back of Weirdeer. Weirdeer is a very simple ride Pokemon letting you jump and speed up how fast you travel. The only drawback to using it is that you can't actually throw Pokeballs while on the back of Weird Ear. But this fact actually becomes beneficial to a viewer watching, since having to get on and off of Weird Ear is just pure eye candy. Matching the, the levels of those philosophical TikTok videos with Minecraft, Minecraft obstacle, obstacle courses made to draw your attention. And I know this is a purely aesthetic thing that technically slows down a speedrun because of a minor setback within the ride mechanic, but something important that almost all Pokemon speedruns are missing is that eye candy factor that most popular speedruns have. Games like Mario, Celeste, Hollow Knight, or Zelda take this concept to the next level and make people want to sit down and just watch. Which makes me really happy to say that for the first time ever, Pokemon finally has that too. And this is especially prevalent in the up and coming boss fights. While they aren't the most difficult boss fights ever, watching the fluidity of a skilled speedrunner make it past a boss you might have had trouble on is just plain beautiful. You usually end up discovering crazy ways of taking them down that you might have missed throughout your own playthroughs. In past Pokemon games that have been speedran, we had nothing eye-catching like this. All people would say is, isn't a Pokemon speedrun just RNG? And it was kind of hard to convince them that it was so much more than that given the straightforward goals and battle-to-battle -battle nature of the games. But now with Legends Arceus having so much physical involvement and strategy, we actually have something to show people when arguing that it isn't just that. And while this is something I truly appreciate having, Weird Ear isn't just there to absorb the attention of someone watching, since it can achieve what a lot of other ride Pokemon can do when you master it. You can glide down cliffs if you just take a few baby steps down the hill along the way, conquer mountains with the tap of a button, and jump across the seas given enough speed and height. But the traveling speed of Weird Ear is one factor that I can only describe as a magnum opus that brings this entire run together more than the research point strategies do. The thing is, Weird Ear is actually so fast that you can sometimes avoid the vision of a Pokemon entirely and swing behind it to perform a backstrike without ever alerting a Pokemon to your presence. And this becomes an even more powerful tool when certain items are available to the player after the Obsidian Field lands. One such case that could easily be a video essay on its own is the Stealth Spray item. Stealth Spray is an item that makes it so that every single step you take cannot be heard by a Pokemon, making it so that a Pokemon cannot detect your presence unless they physically see you stepping in front of them. With the speeds that Weird Ear provides on top of these new stealth tools, the game starts to feel a bit like Assassin's Creed or Dishonored with the way that you speedily and stealthily smack the back of Pokemon's heads with a Pokeball. Just, you know, with a less stabby and more... From here, things just start to become even smoother given the access to more items, better balls, and super clean movement. But there's one final thing I want to cover before ending off this video essay, and that is the question that was bugging my mind before that fateful day that changed my perspective entirely when it comes to Pokemon Legends Arceus speedruns. That being, how could a game with such a complicated and volatile route possibly be speedrun in a marathon setting 
without running into a ton of unreasonable issues. Well, if you've paid enough attention to the small details in this video, I've technically already answered that because the answer is innovation in your strategies. Very rarely will a single thing in a Pokemon game ever be 100% consistent. And as we've already learned, this means a lot more in Arceus because of those volatile spawns, the odds of catching something, and sometimes even the items that you can buy. But where the consistency lies is in how you prepare for those moments where things are shaping up to be at their best or possibly at their worst. In the official competitive Pokemon format VGC, they call this a line. The basic definition of a line is a strategy to improve and communicate often complex processes in clear, easy to understand ways. While a line is slightly different in Legends Arceus speedruns compared to VGC, the same exact fundamentals around a line are still there. And there's no better example of a line than the journey through the final three levels that require point research. The Crimson Mirelands, the Cobalt Coastlands, and finally, the Coronet Highlands. Let's start things in order with the Crimson Mirelands, which is the second stage in the game. In order to get past the Crimson Mirelands, the point total needs to reach 3,500, which isn't super hard to achieve thanks to how abundant many of the targeted Pokemon spawns are. So formulating a basic strategy to go from point A to point B is quite streamlined. Having us grab a ton of Carnivine, Psyduck, Pachirisu, Badoo, Hippopotas, Krigatoon, Rhyhorn, Teddy Ursa, and Tangela. Where the line starts to veer off a bit is based entirely on the items that you've obtained and the number of them that you have. Do you happen to be low on items that can stun a Pokemon like Acorns and Mud Balls? Then it's probably best that you delay Rhyhorn research until the Coronet Highlands. Happen to spot Scatterbangs from Ginter the Shopkeeper before you can even craft them? Looks like you can optimally add Krogunk to that list of mons along your catch route. And as you gain more experience with this run, you end up learning more niche possibilities that can get you over certain point thresholds. One of the more interesting lines of strategy comes from the third level, the Cobalt Coastlands, where your entire strategy needs to be built around the day and night cycle since obtaining a Dusclops is a mandatory part of the story progression and only obtainable at night. When entering a level level in Arceus, you're guaranteed to have the cycle set to morning. With Dusclop in mind, along with a forced story path that takes you to this cliff, the world record finds itself on the beach smacking Machop with stun items, Skyrimming up the mountain, then stockpiling on Glammeow, Vulpix, Beautifly, all of which are daytime encounters. Given we'll then have to travel to the other side of the island to obtain Dusclops, flying back to camp to shorten traveling time becomes optimal. While inside of the camp, you can actually force the time of day to be any time frame that you wish it to be with the press of a button. In particular, we want it to be in the afternoon in order to best take advantage of the time it takes to travel to the other side of the island. And while this does net us daytime spawns as well as nighttime spawns while in the process of getting there, we end up having only about two minutes to catch every single daytime spawn from this point forward before nighttime completely despawns all of the day encounters. This also has a nice after effect on the final point location of the Coronet Highlands, which is filled with a bunch of hard to catch Pokemon. So by forming a line with an even bigger variety of spawns from both day and night, we can just overcompensate in the Cobalt Coastlands, meet the story goal, and finally plan around crossing the 8,500 point threshold with way less stress. But we still have one final piece of underrated research that you'll have been earning throughout the entire game, and that is the battle research points from every single fight you've come across. Now I know we've established up to this point that you can get research points when we use a move, but what about when an opponent NPC uses a move? Well, as it turns out, it absolutely does count towards research points since you're technically seeing a Pokemon go for a move, even if you sometimes don't own that Pokemon. And even though you can't fully predict what your opponent will go for, it's still something you have to remember happening throughout the entire three hour journey if your opponent happens to have a Pokemon that you're planning to catch later on. But it also makes you realize that even though the villains such as these NPCs think they're slowing down your progress, in reality, they're actually helping you just as much as you're helping them by saving the world. And if that deep-seated progression is not what you'd consider innovative, then you should seriously go and experience watching or playing a Pokemon Legends Arceus speedrun for yourself. As one final send-off, I want you all to go give Halkri a follow. Not only did he deal with months of answering my questions on this wild speedrun, this video would seriously not have been possible without him. 